Now let's focus in on uh, shrewdness. Shrewdness. Where do we see it? I heard a story about a young corporate lawyer who was representing a large railroad company that was being sued by a, a small family farmer. It seems that the farmer's prized cow was missing from the field that the train tracks went right through, and the farmer was suing for the value of the cow, assuming something had happened uh, in regard to the railroad. At the first court date, the young attorney and the farmer couldn't have been uh, different in terms of how they looked. They were a contrast to one another. The attorney was well-dressed, polished shoes, spoke eloquently, quickly, and excessively with ease before the judge. The farmer, on the other hand, had his best clothes on, but paled in comparison to the shiny, well-dressed attorney. The farmer spoke rarely, cautiously, even haltingly before the judge, sometimes if, as if he didn't exactly know what to say. Well, they were assigned a court date, and before that next court date, the uh, young, well-dressed corporate attorney met the farmer as he was coming into the courthouse before the start of the case and asked if the farmer was willing to settle out of court for half of the fee that he was asking. He presented all the papers and said, there's even a check right here with your name on it. If you sign it, I'm allowed to give you the check for half the amount. Why don't you just sign right here as the attorney went on and on, handing the, pens, uh, the pen to the farmer who dutifully, upon command, signed his name on the documents and was handed the check. Finally taking a breath, the young attorney looked at the farmer when everything was done and hardly containing his ability to gloat, he said, you know, I could not possibly have won this case if we'd gone to trial. You know, the engineer was asleep in the, uh, in the train and the fireman was in the caboose and he couldn't see anything at all. There were no witnesses that I could put on the stand to give any kind of defense at all. You could have probably won a lot said with a wry smile. The farmer, equally with a wry smile, looked back and replied, well, I'll tell you one thing, young fella. I was a little worried about winning the case as well because this morning that cow came back. Both the farmer and the lawyer were demonstrating shrewdness like the shrewd crook that Jesus lifts up today. Shrewdness. Where do you see it? Do you like it when you see it? The parable of the shrewd steward in Luke 16 is, I think, the most difficult parable to understand. It's probably why Barb is smiling over there and not having had to do it for a bit. Genevieve Timothy, yeah, okay. Timothy and his family. <laughs> One intellectual theologian, German theologian of the last century called this parable the, pro the problem child of all parables because no matter what you do with it, it just won't behave. And indeed, I've been living with it for a couple weeks now because I thought it would behave. I mean, I can see why the Samaritan is called the good Samaritan in that parable because there's values that you would lift up, but why would Jesus make a hero of this story? steward. Now remember also in the, in the Old Testament there were prohibitions against usury, which is the charging of interest to other Jews. He could charge it to non-Jews, but he couldn't uh, charge that against Jewish folks. That's from Deuteronomy 23. And it applied to money and commodities. However, the real emphasis was against loaning money with interest. And that created an opening for the steward in our story for today. He sold commodities from the farm wheat, corn, olive oil, wine, and he financed those purchases by charging interest, gouging. The plot thickens 
because the steward is taking a bigger share of those profits from the boss, from the owner than he should have, than what the boss knew about. When the annual audit was done, the stealing of the steward was found out, and so the boss was firing the steward by saying, get the books together so that uh, we can dismiss you. This is not like today when you'd be walked out of the office in an hour, a little different than that. So he was still in charge of what he was doing. And so here's where the shrewdness of the steward comes in. He got in touch with all those business clients of the boss or the owner. And he said that he had wonderful news for them, that they were such good customers that the boss was willing to offer them a deal. In some cases, cutting their bill as much as 50%. Thus the steward bought some friends for difficult times that were just about to come upon him. When the boss learned what the steward had done, there was really little that he could do about it because if he reinstated the full amount, the customers would fully understand that they were being charged interest and therefore usury, and he did not want to admit to that. He was shrewd on a couple of different accounts. Jesus does not hold up the steward as an example of good behavior for us to follow in his dishonesty. But he does say that there are some things that we can learn about how we operate as children of the light, even from a rascal. And there are two lessons, I think, that this crook lifts up for us. First, we should be as shrewd and as far-sighted as other people are. Verse 8, Jesus says, the people of this world are more shrewd in dealing with their own kind then are the people of the light. Now, being a Christian doesn't mean we have an excuse to not look forward or plan ahead. We ought to be good, good at anticipating what the future is, looking at trends and planning ahead wisely. I remember a famous hockey player talking about how he became a famous hockey player, said he just had the ability to know where the puck was going to be, and he would skate there instead of where the puck was was. He anticipated, planned ahead, and that was the secret of his success. Do you think that Walmart doesn't have a plan for where they're going to put stores over the next, say, 25 years? Now, that doesn't mean the plan's, you know, locked in. Things can happen. But do you think that Walmart has a plan for where they're going to put stores? How about Starbucks? Do you think Starbucks has a plan for where they're going to put stores now that they have stores all over the world, including in China, uh, selling really overpriced and, and burnt coffee. Just a personal opinion. N not a word of the Lord. Just want you to know. Of course they do. Of course they do. So you would think that a denominational body like the LCA would have a plan for where they were going to plant churches over the next well, same period, 10 years or so. But we don't. You might think that a congregation like ours would put all of our efforts behind getting together a plan for what our church is going to look like in 10 years, and it sounds like a good idea. We've made some starts toward that, but do we have a plan in place like that? We should, but we don't. The children of the kingdom should be at least as shrewd and as far-sighted as the children of this age. But oftentimes we aren't. Most of us who are in our working life probably have forced upon us some plan of continuing education. Some of us don't even have it forced upon us. We just take the initiative ourselves to see how we need to be growing and the ways in which we'd like to grow and make those things happen. Most companies require it. Seminars, workshops, reading, schools. Shouldn't we, shouldn't you have a spiritual continuing education plan for, say, the next year? What's yours? I guess the question would be, does anyone in this room have a spiritual continuing education plan in place? If you learned that a close friend or relative didn't have enough resources, by meaning enough employment or enough income or enough health insurance or no health insurance, wouldn't you be concerned? Wouldn't you also go and give some assistance and maybe some advice and help them get what she needed to be covered and the resources that were required. But if you found out that that same person didn't have any spiritual resources, what would you do? Well, you know, I don't want to force my beliefs upon someone else. But you just forced all your financial beliefs on someone else. But would we talk about spiritual resources? I'm not sure we would. 
Jesus used the story of the shrewd crook to teach us the necessity of also being shrewd and farsighted in our lives as Christians. He also talked about this farsighted shrewdness in light of making our earthly possessions serve eternal rewards or our our earthly possessions to make eternal investments. Verse 9, the New International Version reads, Use worldly wealth to gain friends for yourself so that when it's gone, you will be welcomed into eternal dwellings. The line is obscure because the word for uh, for dishonest that is in our NRSV is really the word unrighteous. Not sure what unrighteous kind of wealth is apart from stealing and how that would be applied to eternal homes or whether or not dishonest friends can actually grant us eternal homes or not. So it's a kind of a conundrum for us. But essentially, I think what's being gotten at here is that we're to invest ourselves with an eye toward God's future and God's plan for all creation, eternal dividends. A few years ago, when uh, Chris and I traveled to Italy, we were talking with members of the congregation, and and I can't remember who it was, but one of you shared the story about uh, back in the time before the Italians went to the euro that they had lira, and the exchange rate for lira was a couple thousand uh, to one U.S. dollars, and so uh, they would walk around with wads and wads of money in their pocket, essentially not worth the amount of the, the cost of the paper on which it was printed. You couldn't really buy anything. It talked about walking around with like 10,000 lira in their pocket, which sounded like a huge sum of money. But they said, when we came back to the States, we didn't want to have any lira because 10,000 lira wouldn't even buy us lunch out. One U.S. dollar in heaven be just about the same value, maybe even a little less, than the Italian lira was to U.S. money, unless it's invested in such a way to bring about transformation and some kind of eternal dividend. Any money that I invest in God's plan is an investment that will pay off eternally. You remember the other story that Jesus told, another parable about a rich farmer. It's recorded in Luke uh, chapter 12. His wealth kept growing. And in that story, it said he had he had decent barns. Everything was fine. But his wealth was so exceeding that he decided that he would tear everything down and rebuild bigger and bigger things, mansions of barns. But in that parable, it said that his life was going to be demanded of him and his investment in earthly things. Where would they go? Would they be of any good to him? Of course, the rhetorical question is no. It would go to someone who didn't work for or didn't care about that investment. What are you going to do with the affluence that God has enabled you to earn? I like talking about stewardship when it's not stewardship time because I'm not actually asking you to sign a card or think about what your tithe is. Of course, a tithe, 10% of your income belongs to God. That's the biblical minimum. But what are you going to do about that surplus that you have in your life? That which is required beyond adequate food and shelter and taxes and other necessities. And you're thinking, what excess is that? What surplus is that? Our family budget's usually running pretty close to the red, hardly ever in the black. But isn't that because we've bought the idea that luxuries are actually necessities? That we buy vehicles that are really kind of above our heads financially because of what they say about us. I was in an MBA class this summer, and they talked about marketing at at different companies, and they focused on coffee. I don't know why I'm picking on Starbucks today, but what does it say to carry a Starbucks cup with that very recognizable logo? And there was a fight in the class about Pete's Coffee, Stinky Pete's Coffee, or Starbucks, but more opinions, not word of the Lord. Uh, what coffee tells other people about you? Why do you pay $4.25 for a cup of coffee that you could probably get at McDonald's for three and a half dollars less, especially if you're a senior over 50? Isn't it because we've bought the idea about materialism as much as the rest of the world has, that we see ourselves and our value through the lens that the world gives us and not so much the lens that the gospel gives us. And so we exchange 
luxuries or necessities and it gets confusing to us about what is really essential for our lives and so we outspend ourselves and I would say probably too if if you had a friend after this surplus conversation you're not quite sure about the surplus you had if you had a friend who came to you and had a a hot stock tip and they knew that it was going to make money would you could you find money I bet you probably could When will we ever become eager to invest in kingdom currency? What percentage of your financial portfolio are you planning to use as a kingdom investment? Are you or your company investing in anything like Habitat for Humanity or the ELCA's malaria campaign to stamp out malaria in the world, which is possible if there were the will of the people and political will that would fight AIDS? or hunger in the world, another scourge upon humanity that the current technology we could solve if it weren't for human problems standing in the way? Do you have a will? If not, why not? The non-believers are smart enough to figure out that they don't want to pay the inevitable at the time of the inevitable. What are the inevitables? Death and taxes. At the time of the inevitable, what are you going to pay? The inevitable taxes if you're not quite prepared for that. Should we not also be shrewd? with how we will invest on that day when you are the richest by means of liquid assets. That's the day that you die, by the way. And be prepared for such an event because we all accept that it's inevitable. What a shame it would be to reach that day and those inevitabilities and just give a large portion of what you've earned in taxes. 10% of One of my life insurance policies, the biggest one, will go to support this church. Don't knock me off. That would be a bad thing. And it wouldn't be that much money in the the end run. But what does it mean to provide kingdom currency? Do you want to be assured that after you've left this life, that you invested in the things that you really believe in, the things that you think will make a difference for what God is trying to achieve in the world? Maybe it's starting new mission programs or new churches or various buildings or helping reaching people or transforming lives? Shouldn't that be the end mark in your life when your family looks back and your friends look back and say, I really tried to make a difference? Jesus is right. You can learn a few things from rascals even if you don't follow their example. The shrewd crook in Jesus' story teaches us those two things about being farsighted, about using earthly possessions to make a lesser earthly, and about earthly possessions to make eternal investments in the kingdom. He talks a lot about money. He talks a lot about money. If you look through the parables and the teachings of Jesus, they are almost always recognized as some economic reality in the midst of it. In our time, there's a lot of cultural pressure not to talk about money, isn't there? considered rude to ask someone what something costs and we correct our children when they ask us what their favorite ice cream is and what that costs and it's unthinkable to ask that kind of question in most of our culture there are few things that we deal with in our lives that have an equal reverence for money or share an equal amount of fear Because we can recognize that money exerts such a force as we deal with money on such an emotional level that it can be something like an idol. And I know you're saying, but we don't set up money and statues and worship them in our home. That is a very common question that tends to captivate our minds. Think about house values. Friends of mine decide what that house is worth. Do they 
we worry about one another and spend more than the next guy, or if we're the next guy, we worry about the fact that someone else doesn't have money. It's a constant source of anxiety. If there's anything that creates praying time, those are the things that we're putting treasure into. And those are the things that technically we might say we worship. The parable reminds us that money exerts force in this life. The parable reminds us that we can be both good stewards or we can be bad ones. The parable reminds us that we can have a dangerous spiritual relationship with money or we can have a healthy spiritual relationship with money. And the Bible is not silent on what that healthy relationship looks like. The idea of stewardship is far more than giving money to your church, although the church makes the mistake of talking that way at least once a year. The idea of stewardship is how you're going to manage all the great gifts that God has given you, including your money and your time and your effort and your energy, and where you invest them in things and where you spend them. So if you have some things going awry in your account, you don't have the responsibility of having to call in the accounting person. The parable makes us question the kind of steward that we are of our money, the kind of steward that we are of our relationship, our resources, and decide things that only come from you and invest in things that really come from you. This parable is not easy, and when you really take what I am talking about and apply it here, you'll realize why Bert Mann called this the problem child of parables, because there is no easy handle. It's more like a bowling ball rolled in olive oil. So God gives us this parable. It is hard to learn, and yet it's better to learn the parable than to learn the story. So if you look at our lives, if we are truly men and investing in things that we trust with each day, our relationship with one another, and invest in those things so that they become far Go back and look again. Allow the sting in your heart like a splinter um, that needs to fester until it comes to the surface and then you can glean from it the lessons that you have. The Bible is an amazing book because it doesn't present us always with easy answers, but it does give us some colossal, terrific facts of life in which we are called to live into and to become our better selves because of the call to discipleship and the call to love one another in this life for the sake of the next.